And unfortunately, we don't have time, but Laura, you're going to be around. So if anybody has questions, here is Laura. I think it was a very interesting study. Um, you, you have a paper as well, so they can check out the paper, right? So please talk to her if you want to know more about that interesting research. So now it's time to hear about Venezuela. So there have been some Venezuelans here, but to hear actually about Venezuela, I think we need somebody that lives in Venezuela and that actually is coming from there. And she is uh, Minaya Bisaña de Armas, and she is the chair for the Develop Department of Scientific Computing, Computation and Statistics at Simón Bolívar University, Venezuela. Please uh, welcome uh, Minaya. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I'm going to start with the fact that was already stated from the previous talk. And it is the fact that uh, Venezuela has lost positioning in terms of the development and the science and technology that we have access today. And there are many factors that have come into play and that have influenced this uh, outcome. Uh, and in order to understand a little bit where we're coming from and understand also the better parts of our history, I'm going to guide you through a little bit of uh, where we've been and how we can learn from all those previous experiences. Okay, so our science and technology pretty much starts off at 1935. This is when uh, now the country uh, with the oil revenue starts uh, in this process of modernization and becoming a rural country into a more modernized one. And there were significant efforts into the sanitation process, healthcare, and all the infrastructure that goes with that. Uh, of course, uh, much uh, went into that, uh, a lot of efforts led by uh, top scholars, uh, uh, Dr. Gabaldon, I could mention one, for example, Dr. Tejera, and then within 25 years' time, malaria, tuberculosis was eradicated in Venezuela, and we were one of the first, or the first country to uh, accomplish that. The next period is, whoops, Okay, is what we call the modernization period. So now oil revenue really skyrocketed and boosted our economy, as you can see from the GDP there. The Venezuela chart is way off and just lifted from, if you compare it, for example, to more stable and growing economies such as the United States or, say, United Kingdom. And this really attracted a lot of people interested in taking part of the scientific production and, and just the building of, of this country. Um, many from Europe, other areas of Latin America, came into Venezuela and very much uh, contributed to the development of our science and technology and set the initial foundations for research institutes, new universities were created, uh, other universities were reopened, they had to be closed at that moment, and uh, a lot of research was done within the area of what was now our most uh, significant ac uh, economic activity. The following period was, or has been called, the industrialization period. Now, this period is not as lucky as the previous one in which our economy started to decline, maybe due to uh, very bad choices, political uh, and economic choices. However, uh, the muscle or, or the brain had already been installed, and Venezuela continued on the path of innovation and science and technology and started the process of knowledge transfer into what was our main industry, which was the oil uh, production. In this moment, I would have to say that we didn't do it alone. We had a lot of help from many organizations, not just uh, within this local network, but also from abroad. And here, uh, the Inter-American Bank of Development had a lot to do with this success and the installment of, of, uh, of, of a s infrastructure and this uh, great academic and research activity. One of the most successful programs in this period is this scholarship program that allowed Venezuelans to go abroad, uh, be formed in these specialized areas, and then go back to the country to apply it and to successfully uh, advance in, in terms of science and technology. I am one 
a product of one such initiative in my family. My father is also one of those. So uh, I would say it was not just because it's my experience. I just think it is a very positive one at that. But the following period, in spite of the fact that now the blue line just starts uh, going crazy uphill, uh, that, that, that didn't necessarily translate into better science and technology. There was a shift in the country in terms of uh, the policies that were being taken in place. And uh, those policies affected greatly the scientific production, as you can see in this following graph. Uh, Dr. Requena and Dr. Caputo, they collected the number of publications that were uh, done in Venezuela during the period spanning from 1960 all the way down to 2005. And you can see that in this the last period that is uh, pretty much shaded, the growth that had been sustained was all of a sudden lost and with a very big drop. Uh, many factors come into play, but we believe that one of the greatest uh, and, and most important factors is the loss of talent, the loss and the migration of those talented researchers. And it's easy to identify and quantify how many people we have lost. Uh, research in Venezuela is mainly performed or done in public institutions or in those research institutions, so uh, we can count ourselves, we know who we are, and we know how many we have lost. To put an example, in Universidad Simón Bolívar, which is where I've been working, we've lost from 2005 to the present moment 50% of our staff. And now that is a big number and a big chunk. But not only the number should like wow us, but who did we lose? We lost the younger uh, researchers. So we have this generational gap that now we need to deal with and we need to solve urgently. In general, it's hard to say how many migrated. The previous uh, speaker said that there was an estimate of three million. Others go all the way to five million. I feel five million closer to uh, the reality. However, uh, it's very hard to know because data is not always accessible to be able to quantify, not just Venezuelan data, but also Venezuela, uh, data of all the other uh, governments who uh, receive Venezuelans. But uh, some other reports, uh, say from Dr. Hausman, they um, estimate that the worst loss was in the previous two years. Now, the graphs that I showed you from the number of publications, it's cut in 2016, so I spared you the bloodshed. <laughs> so, okay, so we're in the middle of this uh, crisis, humanitarian, almost like a war zone. What do we do now, right? This image is pretty powerful. I really like it. This is London Library 1940. And in the middle of this despair, you might, you know, you tend to put your hands in your head and you think, okay, so what do we do now? We look to the past and we wonder, well, what did we do right? One of the things that we did correctly was invest education. Everybody said it all the time for all the panelists in every single uh, intervention that I've heard. But uh, this doesn't mean we're gonna do the same all over again. The same does not necessarily apply. And we have to realize where we're standing now. What do we have to work with? What are those elements that we can really uh, leverage ourselves on? And in here, well, the true elements are who are our allies? What are the human resources? What type of information can we provide to attain real education? And of course, the infrastructure that we have available. So let's start with the allies. There are natural allies, of course, within the country. We have those other universities who, like us at Simon Bolivar, are also very interested in advancing science and technology. And of course, are interested in this uh, deeply rooted problem, which is education. Of course, New allies, and I'm glad to be here and to be able to know a lot of you people, and I hope that all of you now become our allies. And, but we cannot, as I said before, we didn't do it alone in the past when we had uh, lots of revenue. We can definitely not do it alone now, and we need funding. We need funding from 
uh, nonprofit organizations and profit companies who really are interested in investing in Venezuela. Access to information when we talk about education is vital, vital. And information is a scarce commodity in Venezuela and for most of our youngers. And when I talk about education, I don't mean necessarily uh, the top uh, researchers, top university, although that is very important. I'm also referring to uh, primary, middle school, or even uh, informal education. That is also very important for us at the moment. And we need to be able to provide, reach out to those people who genuinely need uh, this type of, of information and education in order to all together push forward. Uh, I have very little time, I'm going to skip through this, but in, in our uh, experience, the access to education has really had an impact on the performance of students, uh, say, when they have uh, information to work on as to when they don't. Uh, just briefly in this right panel, we have the blue population and the orange population. The blue people, they had access to information. The orange ones didn't. And they were measured by the same standard. They all failed, by the way. This red line <laughs> is uh, the passing grade. So that speaks about the quality. One thing that uh, governments always uh, look at is uh, how many people are at schools. But we don't really measure the quality of the education that we're giving. and that's. We need to keep that in mind. And of course, there's a great opportunity for artificial intelligence in information. OK, so I, I, I said that 50% left. And uh, what is left? We are, uh, well, those are the human resources we have. And of course, all our allies and all the uh, people, Venezuelans, like uh, wonderful, uh, that are here at MIT. Uh, professors now. Scholars make less than 10% monthly wage. We have zero dollars for research budget. Yet, in those conditions, we are able to continue our job in education. We are still able to maintain the university, our university, in the number one ranking nationwide and uh, position 38 in the most recent QS ranking for Latin America. You got to wonder who are these guys, right? <laughs> Thank you. And in terms of infrastructure, when you think about that, well, I'm at an AI conference, and there's a lot of uh, what you can say about infrastructure. Um, but when you're talking about this technology, uh, one of the most obvious ones is, well, how many internet users you have? How many cell phones? How many computers do you have? And uh, Tendencias Digitales, this is a company that has um, position, it's based in, in many different countries, and they evaluate the infrastructures. They have uh, assessed that almost 60% of Venezuelans have access to the internet, mostly for mobile and computers. A big chunk of it comes from the lower, the most impoverished uh, people, which is, of course, the chunk of our population. So it's no wonder at that. And whatever solutions we can come up with, we need to do so, keeping this in mind, grounded and rooted in what we have available, our resources, and how we can enhance those resources and use it to the best of our abilities. So going back to this uh, image, there's a lot of ways you can read this, right? You can focus on the roof that has collapsed and feel very hopeless. Or you can focus on those three gentlemen and feel very hopeful. I haven't been to London. And most recent times, and I don't know how the library looks like, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't look like that anymore. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Isaiah. So as I, thank you, guys. <laughs> So uh, we contacted her, how, how long ago, six months ago or something? Yes, so she, she wanted to come. 
and we're glad that she was able to. So she lives she in Venezuela. You never lived uh, outside Venezuela, right? Or have you? you no, know, yes, I did my PhD okay. here. And while my father was studying, nice. I also lived in the States. And okay. I had the opportunity of sabbaticals in England and uh, the States also. So okay. I've been the privileged few. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you a lot. And let's hope for Venezuela that things improve. Thank you.